Hi everyone, and welcome to week three of pop culture. Uh, believe it or not, we're already pretty much halfway done through the chorus, so that's kind of crazy. Um, this week we're doing uh, Let's Explore Diabetes with Owls by David Sedaris. Uh, I was looking forward to this probably the most um, when teaching the class because I love David Sedaris. Um, I've read all of his books and essays. I think he's really smart and really, really funny, and he's a great writer. Um, so I'm excited to talk about it and hear what you guys think about it. Um, first of all, a little about David Sedaris. Uh, if you've never heard of him before, um, he's a pretty famous comedy writer. He has at least like probably seven or eight books out, and he's been on radio shows, and he always writes for The New Yorker. Uh, so he's pretty popular, um, and uh, all of his books are similar to this one, um, a bunch of comedic essays. Probably the one he's most famous for is Me Talk Pretty One Day, uh, so if you've ever heard of that, that's uh, one, of David, uh, one of David Sedaris' books. Um, David Sedaris uh, grew up in North Carolina, and he is Greek Orthodox, like really Greek, like his grandparents were off the boat Greek. Um, so Greek or Orthodox, gay, and grew up in North Carolina. So that's why some of his stories are so funny, because if you just imagine the three of those things put together, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, so the reason I wanted to look at this book uh, in our class is because I think uh, Sedaris does a really good job of commenting on American culture. Um, there's a lot in this book about what it means to be an American, what American society is like, what Americans are like, and most of it, as you could probably tell, is not very positive. Um, David Sedaris is very liberal tends to lean way to the left, uh, so we can talk about how there's a bias there, which uh, he obviously has a particular readership. He's going to alienate a lot of people uh, by the things that he writes about. So his audience, even though it's a popular culture audience and he's a popular author, no one would consider this uh, a literary text. Um, he does have a more limited audience because he's very, very, very liberal, um, as I'm sure you've seen. So uh, the four things that this book really comments on are what it means to be an American, gender, sexuality, uh, and race, and family. Okay, so um, those four things. America and Americans, gender and sexuality, <clears throat> race and family, okay? Um, and the stories in here um, make a lot of interesting observations um, about those things, which we've already seen in, in Family Guy, uh, those tenets were definitely commented on Family Guy, you know, what it means to be an American, gender and sexuality, race, family, okay, and now we have, you know, a live person doing it instead of an animated TV show. So, obviously, I'm not going to have time to go through each and every story in this book, and some of them, you know, are not maybe as pertinent as others. Some of them are just funny, um and not totally relevant to what I want to talk about. Um, so, of course, uh, the first story, um, Doctor's Dentist Without Borders, um, is really all about uh, Americans' fear of Obamacare and, you know, other, place, other places have socialized health care, and, you know, so many people were like, oh, other places have socialized health care, and, like, it's just terrible, and everything's awful, and uh, Sedaris is like, no, actually, I lived in France, and it was actually pretty awesome. Um, he has a similar essay to this one uh, when he broke his arm in France in another book of his, and he talks about how simple it was. Um, 
He also sort of, in this story, kind of shows that Americans tend to freak out about medical health. You know, every little thing gets examined. Uh, there's this obsession with finding something physically wrong with you um, that he seems to be saying is not really present, uh, you know, with the French, <laughs> which is which is kind of funny um, because... You know, he says, like on page um, <clears throat> on page uh, four and five of the print copy book, um, Sedaris has shown the French doctor a small lump he found on his rib cage, and he said, "Oh, that's nothing—a fatty tumor. Dogs get them all the time." Um, and then David says. When I asked if the tumor would get any bigger, the doctor gave it a gentle squeeze. Bigger? Sure, probably. Will it get a lot bigger? No. Why not, I asked. And he said, sounding suddenly weary, I don't know. Why don't trees touch the sky? So <laughs> this story um, is really sort of mocking not only Americans' fear of socialized health care, but also Americans' fear of health in general, our obsession with health, our obsession of finding out, you know, what's wrong with us and how to fix it and how to treat it. And people do all this stuff. And he seems to be saying, you know, people in France aren't as high strung about this. Okay. Um, the next story, Attaboy, is all about, you know, the entitled American child and entitled parents, you know. And this is, I feel like, especially with your generation, um, uh, your parents and even my parents are very much like, you never would have done that, you know, we would have, you know, paddled you or laid you over our knee and blah, 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 what that kid, what that kid needs is a good beating, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I'm sure you hear your parents say that all the time. So in a way, David Sedaris is um, doing the same thing. Uh, and he recalls the funny story about his dad basically wanting to beat up somebody, which I think is, is pretty funny. Um, the Think Differenter story is one of, is the first, um, forensic essay in the text. I actually was in forensics, like, he's not making that up, that's a real thing. Maybe some of you were in it, um, as well. I know, uh, one of you is a theater acting major, so maybe you were in forensics in high school. But it is, like what he says in the author's note, you you stand in front of judges and other competitors and you recite um, a monologue competitively. And you can do it in a whole bunch of different ways. You can do drama or you can do comedy or you could do a duo with somebody else. And so it's kind of funny that he included these essays and said and says, you know, we could use these for forensic competitions, mainly because... They are all so negative. Um, they are really, really, really nasty depictions of Americans, pretty much. Uh, the most horrible, stereotyped, conservative Americans. And, you know, here is a place where I think, you know, the audience, this is where Sedaris is going to lose part of his audience, right? Because he has decided, I'm writing for the liberal reader, and if someone's conservative, I'm going to make them look terrible. And that may not be the best decision, um, but he still sells all his books. So, uh, so the Think Differenter, you know, is all again just about entitled Americans, right? Or Americans worrying more about objects. In this particular essay, it's all about the iPhone, right? So the father can't remember if his mother and father are alive or moments about his children, but he's just concerned about which iPhone he's going to get or like when the newest iPhone comes out. And I think, unfortunately, there's some truth um, to that. Uh, you know, we're all constantly attached to our phones and wanting the newest phone and the newest, you know, Apple, whatever that comes out. Um, so there is some, some truth to that essay. Um, the memory lapse story... Uh, one of your questions I posted on the forum this week is, 
I feel like, and in David Sedaris's other books as well, I feel like he's constantly seeking his father's approval. Um, and he doesn't really paint his father in a very positive light uh, whenever we see his father come up in stories. His father is usually like running around in his underwear or doing something else ridiculous. Um, and in Memory Lapse, it's, his father seems almost very cold. He's more interested in this other kid swimming and, you know, winning swimming meets than Sedaris' own participation. And, and he finds that, you know, um, really hurtful. Uh, and I think that that is such a, it's really a beautifully written story. And it's such a typical American story, like that constant desire of approval from your mother or your father. Um, and you feel like you're not getting it. And so one of the questions I asked you is like, where else do we see that in this, in this book of essays? Cause we see it, I feel several times, um, uh, throughout the text. And, you know, what sort of commentary is that on American culture, that constant desire for our parents' um, approval? Um, next is A Friend in the Ghetto. Um, this is uh, one of the stories that really touches on the issue um, of race and about how David sort of intentionally makes friends uh, with a heavy set black girl because he wants a black friend. Um, you have to remember this is North North Carolina, so we're in the South. Um, so this would have been, you know, we're in the South, and it's, you know, in in the '60s or '70s or maybe even the '50s at that point. So I mean, it would have been kind of, you know, unseemly for him to be friends um, with a black with a young black girl, uh, and I think. You know, he talks all about the reasons he wanted this black friend was really to say, oh, I have a black friend. Um, and uh, I think, like, one of the best passages um, is on page uh, 54 when he runs into this black woman later in life when they're adults and he sees her. Um, he says, and this is on page 54, by this time, we were in our 20s, and I understood that friendship could not be manufactured. You didn't look through your address book thinking, where are the Koreans? Or I need to meet more paralyzed people. No, Not that it's outlandish to have such friends, but they have to be made organically. Okay, I think that's really brilliant, uh, because here he's also sort of calling out um, that kind of liberal colorblind attitude where I don't care what color you know I have friends of all colors I have blah 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 but he's saying you can't just make friends with people so you could put them like check them off some sort of list like oh I have an Asian friend I have a black friend I have a paralyzed friend I have a mentally handicapped friend he said that's not true friendships and you know this book is is so much about relationships, whether it's family or uh, relationships with other men that he's met. Um, and he's saying, like, friendships have to be made organically. You can't check off just another box. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful sentiment uh, while also being, you know, sort of funny. Like, where are the Koreans? Where are the paralyzed people? Uh, so I really love that passage um, in particular. Uh, and I think it says something also about about race, um, about this need to force yourself to have friends from another race or another culture, and, but that's not really what friendship is about, and that's not really how to go about eradicating racism, right? Um, Loggerheads uh, is very much a story about David coming into his own as as a homosexual, right? It, like kind of realizing that he's gay as a young child. Um, and, you know, they capture the poor sea turtles. And <laughs> it's just depressing, the poor turtles. Um, but I want you to think, like, how are those turtles a metaphor for David's, young David's own experience, um, kind of feeling trapped and knowing what he needs to do and unable to do it, right? Uh, and then, of course, he encounters um, the gay men, you know, having sex 
in the library. And, you know, that's a really awakening moment for him as a young child. So think about that, how that shapes his ideas of masculinity, of homosexuality, about who he is as a person. Uh, so that story seems really simple, but I think it has a really big impact if you think about all those events occurring um, to him as a young boy who is, you know, kind of figuring out who he is, especially figuring out, you know, that he's not straight, right? So that's a really great story. Um, if I Rule the World, another <laughs> forensic story, um, a monologue, uh, you know, about Jesus, and it's pretty, again, pretty cruel, really funny, really funny, um, but, you know, again, you have to think, what truth is there to this? I mean, do people use Jesus like this in this hypocritical way? And I think they do, right? I mean, I think there is truth in it. Is he, does he take a little too far? Is he a little too unforgiving? Maybe, yeah, but I mean, this, you know, especially with these forensic essays, I have to, we have to think, where is the, where is the truth in these essays, right? Um, okay, so next is uh, Easy Tiger, and I really like this because uh, when I was in undergrad, you know, many moons ago, I was an English literature major, but I also majored in um, modern languages, which means I had to take three languages at once uh, very intensely, and I took French, Italian, and German. Um, and the goal of that major was to master at least two of the languages and be proficient in the third. So, um, and I am, I'm totally literate, 100% literate in French, which means I can read it. Um, and in Italian, my spoken Italian is very good because I lived in Rome for a while. Um, my German, not so good, which is funny because he talks about his German. I mean, German's a really hard language. Uh, but I really relate to this and I know several of you mentioned that, you know, you love traveling and, and you want to travel more. And, uh, when it comes to learning another language, like he, Sedaris just nails it. Um, and there's some other essays in, uh, in his other books where he talks about learning French before he lived in France and they're so funny. Um, but what I think is particularly interesting, uh, about this essay is the idea of the ugly American traveler. And having lived uh, in Italy, that is not a myth, right? I mean, there are definitely ugly American travelers, and the Europeans in particular have come to expect um, ugly American travelers, which is why they usually don't uh, take too kindly to Americans. That's not always true, but, but a lot of times it is. We used to when I lived in Italy, I used to tell people I was Canadian because they'd be nicer to me. So I would say, Sono Canadese, I am, I am Canadian. Um, but in particular, I want to point out a passage um, on page 83 here. And he says, Now for the traveling American, there's less of a need for phrase books. Not only do we expect everyone to speak our language, we expect everyone to be fluent. I rarely hear an American vacationer say to a waiter or shopkeeper in Europe, your English is so good. Rather, we act as if it were part of his job, like carrying a tray or making change. In this respect, the phrase books and audio programs are an almost charming throwback, a suggestion that the traveler put himself out there, that he opened himself to criticism and not the person who's just trying to scrape by selling meatballs in Bumfuccio, Italy. So there is a lot of truth uh, to that statement um, in my experience. I mean, you do go to Europe and pretty much everyone does speak English, but the interesting thing is we expect uh, people to speak English and we don't say, oh, you did such a good job because we, have, we just expect people to speak English. Where I feel in the United States, we can be very, very, very intolerant of people who don't speak English. And there's, you know, people flip out about things being in Spanish or the Spanish, you know, select two to hear Spanish or whatever. And, and it's just very interesting when you think about that and think about language and 
why do we feel that everyone must speak English? I mean, if you come here and you live here, yeah, you're eventually going to need to know English, but Americans can be very intolerant of uh, travelers or tourists that don't speak English um, because we expect them to speak English. Uh, whereas when we travel, we expect foreigners to speak English. So I think he, he really nails it there. Um, what do you think? Do you think that that's true in your experience? Um, I want to know what other people think about that. Because in my experience, when I lived in Europe, it was very true. But maybe things have changed. I don't know. Um, the next story is a uh, laugh kookaburra, which I love. I think it's I think it's a really good story. Um, you know, it seems like when you're reading it, oh, this is another story about him traveling and he's traveling in Australia. But it ends up being a story about family and the importance of family. And I, I think what's so great about Sedaris is he's so funny, but then he can be really, really genuine and really really heartwarming almost, uh, not to be corny, but, um, you know, so they're visiting, you know, with this woman and she says, you know, your life is like a stove with four burners and to be successful, you have to let one go out and to be really successful, you have to have two go out and the four burners are your health, your family, uh, your friends or your career. And so she said to be really successful, you have to let two of those go out. That is not your career. And, uh, towards the end, um, of that story, uh, on page 98, um, after David, uh, had fed the, you know, the kookaburra on the deck of this restaurant, um, uh, in Australia, uh, he says, I didn't have the anal ana oh my goodness. I didn't have the analogy of the stove tap back then, but what I'd done was turn off the burner marked family. Then I'd locked my door and sat there simmering, knowing even then that without them I was nothing. Not a son or a brother, but just a boy. And how could that ever be enough? As a full grown man it seems no different. Cut off your family and how would you know who you are? Cut them off in order to gain success. And how could that success be measured? What would it possibly mean? So I think that's really interesting. Um, he's saying he didn't have the analogy, you know, the stove top when he was a child. And he's talking about, you know, uh, singing the song over and over again with his sister until eventually his dad gets pissed off and, you know, kind of bends him over his knee and smacks him. And, you know, and he's saying, oh, when I was little, I'd have, I'd have turned off that family burner right away. And then he kind of realizes as an adult, how do you measure how successful you are if your family is not behind you? You know, and I think that's really fascinating because, A, it's very beautiful. Like, I think it's a very nice way to put it. But, again, it's that desire for approval. Like, he wants approval from his father and, and his family so badly and I think that's such an American trait to want to get approval from your parents. Um, and we can talk more about that. Um, okay, next um, we have the uh, standing still uh, story, uh, which is when David's sister gets uh, attacked um, by a black man. And again, we have this address of race, right? Um, you know, on page 108, um, he says, Of all the possibilities, why did he have to be black, especially in North Carolina, where everything was so loaded? I think Gretchen was feeling the same way. Not that she needed to let this slide, but that she was caught up in some tiresome cliche. Now here was her father organizing a posse, right? So, I mean, he recognizes, uh, you know, the sort of unfortunate, not irony, but just the unfortunate 
the unfortunate circumstance that it has to be a black guy. He's like, why can't it be a white guy? Why does it have to be a black guy? Why do we have to increase that stereotype, you know, that black men want to rape white women? Um, but it was what it was. Um, but it's interesting, you know, that he feels, you know, that pressure of it being a cliche and, you know, I mean, I think we need to think about that Sedaris is very clear, you know, when he talks about race, but he's also talking from a position of privilege, right? Like, he's a white man, okay? And he may be a white gay man, which reduces his privilege, but he's still a white man. So can you... Can you feel sorry for another race or feel that you are, you know, trying to uh, eliminate this idea of racism um, when you're white, like when you're speaking from that position. Um, so I think it's really interesting in that story that, you know, he says, why does the guy have to be black? Why did he have to be black? Uh, this story also is him, again, seeking approval from his father. And one of your discussion questions is, like, this story is supposed to be about Gretchen, about her getting attacked, but it ends up still being about David longing for approval from his family. So I want you to think about that and what that means. Um, the <clears throat> the uh, Just a quick email, again, Americans, money, we're all terrible. So I want you to think about that one. Um, okay, a guy walks into a bar car is a really great story. Um, and I think it asks a lot of questions. And so here's the questions I want you to think about um, about that story. How do we meet people? How do we create relationships with people? Um, you know, he talks about, you know, the straight guy, the drunk guy, right? that he hangs out with, but he also reminisces back to uh, the foreign guy and how they, you know, he could have gotten off the train and been with this young foreign man, right? Um, the Lebanese man, right? Uh, but it all, this story reminds me of, there's a meme on Facebook that s says something like, friendship is really weird because it's basically... You find a human that you like, like you pick a human out and you like them and then you do stuff together and that's the basis of friendship. Um, I think that's really interesting and you know a lot of these stories are about relationships and forming relationships and maintaining relationships and I think that this story, it just shows that desperation of a wanting to connect to another human being. And it's funny and ridiculous. You know, there's the guy telling funny jokes and they're holed up in this, you know, train bathroom smoking pot and it's ridiculous. Um, but really behind all the funny parts of it is, is just that desperation for human connection, right? So what does that say about Americans, our, our desperation to be connected to other people? Is that a, an American trait or a human trait? And if it's an American trait, how is it different than forming relation relationships elsewhere? Are American relationships different than other places? That's another thing uh, to think about. Okay. Now. Um, I want to skip... The author-author story is funny. Um... But I want to skip uh, to the Obama, uh, the Obama story. And, you know, he says, again, he's living in France uh, during the Obama election. And what's really interesting is the French are like, oh, those Americans are never going to elect a black president. Like, it's just not going to happen. Which is interesting because when you think of other countries thinking of America you tend not to think of those countries thinking of us as, like, not free or limiting or not liberal, uh, especially because so many of the other countries that 
we are involved with that are in the news, right, like the Middle East tend to be even more conservative than we are. And so you don't think of other countries, you know, pointing at America going, well, they're not free enough to elect a black president. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and uh, let's see here, on page 152, um, I want to go back to talking about race for a second. And, and so Darius is really good about talking about uh, race as a white man. You know, I said earlier, does he have the right to talk about race in the way that he does because he's talking from a position of privilege, right? But he, I think he very clearly articulates what a lot of people coming from a position of privilege, right? Like being white, like how they address race and racism in their daily lives. Um, he says, um, okay, uh, it's page 152. He said, uh, how could I be racist when my first boyfriend was black? My first boyfriend was black as well, but that doesn't prove I'm colorblind, just that I like big butts. If I'm walking down an American street and anyone darker than a peanut shell approaches, I'll say hello. This because if I don't say it, he or she might think that I'm anxious, which of course I must be, otherwise I'd walk by in silence just as I do with my fellow Caucasians. Does this make me racist or simply race conscious? Either way, I'm more afraid of conservatives than I am of black people. I think a lot of Americans are. Thus, when questioned by for foreign journalists, I'd predict with confidence that Obama would win. This would get me a shake of the head and a look that translated in five languages to poor dreamer. So I think um, I think that's really interesting because he's saying, you know, does the fact that I go out of the way to prove that I'm not uncomfortable, does that actually show that I am uncomfortable? Um, and I think that's an interesting dilemma that we all experience every day with race. Um, so I want you to think about that. Uh, the other thing I want you to think about is when I was in college I took a class on uh, philosophy and race and my professor uh, said something really interesting um, and I'm this is if if you're white I'm saying it's okay so if you're white and I have I've been guilty of this in the past. I've tried to change it. When we refer to friends who are black or Asian or gay or something different other than the norm of white, we tend to label it, right? So you say like, oh, you know, you know, my friend Nick, he's black, right? Or oh, you know, my friend Brendan, he's gay. Or you know, my friend Cho, she's Asian, right? We tend to do that um, as white people. And so he said, try playing the white game, whereas every time you mention someone's name who's white, follow up with, you know, they're white. Like, you know, my friend Susan, yeah, she's white, you know, that one. And people will be like, what? Why are you saying that? But, you know, because we don't tend to qualify white people, we don't qualify their description as white because there's just like an assumption that the dominant race is white. So, of course, the person I'm talking about is white. Why would I label them? Yet, when we talk about someone different, we tend to label them. Um, so that's a fun game to play with people. It really freaks people out when you do that. But it also makes you realize kind of the systemic racism that exists in our country, right? Um, the other thing about this Obama uh, essay is that when I lived in Italy, I had a similar experience in that, you know, if you know, if Italians knew you were American, so they'd come, you know, they'd be like, to say Americana, are you American? And you'd say, you know, si, sono Americana, yeah, I'm American. And they'd go, ti piace Bush, ti piace Bush, because I lived there in 2007. So they'd be like, do you like Bush? Do you like Bush? Um, so they're very, like, concerned about, do you like President Bush or not? Um, so I think it's interesting that, you know, in France, so Darius had this similar experience with, like, who are you voting for? Are you voting for Obama? They'll never elect Obama, blah, blah, blah. So um, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, on page... Um, on page 155 of that essay, 
Uh, I just wanted to go over this because I think it's pretty funny. Um, so he talks about how some people, uh, and again, this ties into what I was saying earlier, that it's, it's interesting to see, you know, the nation of France calling us sort of old-fashioned, right? Because we don't think of ourselves as old-fashioned. Like, they're so old-fashioned they wouldn't elect a black president. Uh, and then Sedaris is talking about how, you know, so many conservatives were like, if Obama's elected, I'm, you know, I'm leaving. I'm going to leave America. Uh, so on page 155, one after another, they all threaten the same thing. If McCain doesn't win, I'm leaving the country. Oh, right, I'd say. You're going to leave and go where? Right-wing Europe? In the Netherlands now, I imagine it's legal to marry your own children. Get them pregnant, and you can abort your unborn grandbabies in a free clinic that used to be a church. The doctor might be a woman who became a man and then became a woman again, all on taxpayers' dollars, but as long as she saves the stem cells, she'll have the nation's blessing. <laughs> I think that's really funny because... He's pointing out that most of Europe um, is actually a little more liberal than the United States. So, you know, conservatives saying, I'm leaving, I'm going to Canada, or, I, you know, I'm leaving the country. Like, well, Canada even is a little more liberal than the United States, and so is England, and so is France, and most definitely the Netherlands, most definitely Germany. Um, so I just thought that was really funny. It was one of the funniest passages. Um, I pretty much laughed. For a while after reading that, you can abort your unborn grandbabies. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. Um, you know, standing by the next essay is, you know, more kind of observations. Um, uh, about American culture. And, you know, he talks about um, being in the airport and observing other people. And uh, so it's kind of, you know, similar to the theme um, of the other stories. Uh, I Break for Traditional Marriage is another forensic uh, story, which, again, is just, you know, I'm going to go and just shoot everybody now that gay marriage is legal. Um, again, it's harsh. It's harsh. And I want you to think about what is the effect of those stories being so incredibly harsh. Um, okay. Uh, the Understanding, Understanding Al's um, essay, again, is about human relationships, right? Like, he's just so amazed that the taxidermist could read him that quickly, like read who he was and how Hugh, um, his partner, and that's his real life, um, partner, you know, doesn't see all those sides of him. And, you know, he's just fascinated. Like how could someone understand you that quickly? Um, so that's a really great one. Um, the <laughs> number two to go China, basically just a story about poop and shit. So We'll leave it at that. Um, it's really funny. It, it cracked me up, but we'll we'll move on. Um, the healthcare freedoms and why I want my country back. Another funny forensic uh, forensic story where a son is basically just making fun of his mother. Um, so again, more super anti-American sentiment. Um, the now hiring friendly people. After that is again. Uh, Sedaris just observing other Americans and how ridiculous they can be. Um, so that one's pretty funny. Uh, the rubbish story um, is, you know, him cleaning up trash in, in West Texas, or Sussex, the Sussex, which is uh, also really funny. Um, let's skip ahead to the happy place, uh, the story that kind of ends, uh, this book, which is all about the colonoscopy, <laughs> which, you know, and it's, it's titled the happy place, which is so funny because the happy place is getting a colonoscopy and it's not even, you know, I think people are gonna be like, Oh God, he's going to talk about enjoying a colonoscopy because he's, he's gay. Right. But really he's enjoying it because of the drug high that, that you're on. Cause you're basically on twilight laughing gas. Um, but, I think that the reason this story 
is important and the reason he ends the collection with it. Like, yeah, there's the poem about um, the dogs, which is funny. Uh, but this story really kind of ends, you know, the series of stories um, in the book. And I think what's so interesting is it's titled The Happy Place. And the way it ends is that idea of finally of his father giving him the approval, giving him the protection and love and affection that he's, he's wanted, right? And so, you know, his father's the one that kind of convinces him to go get this colonoscopy. And, you know, he finally does it. And then, you know, his father's like, oh, is everything okay? And he lies and says, no, I have cancer, which, which is terrible, right? And, um, and his father is super, super, super supportive. Uh, and, you know, he ends the, the story and basically this collection of stories with eventually I would set him straight. But until then, at least for another few seconds, I wanted to stay in this happy place. So loved and protected, so fulfilled. Um, and I think that's really fascinating to end the collection that way. Um, that the only way he can get his father's approval and affection is through death or the idea of death um, and through being dishonest. Um, and, you know, it makes you wonder if maybe that approval and love and affection has been there all along and he hasn't seen it. Um, and I just think it's a lovely way to, to end the collection because his happy place is that approval and affection of his father. Um, and then, of course, we have the funny, the funny dog poem of which um, the funniest part is um, Dash Hound Skip from Winnipeg loves to hump his master's leg. Every time he gets it up, he stains Bill's calves with unborn puppy. <laughs> so that's so funny. I just can't. Ah. So um, I hope I kind of explained the book and the meaning I see in it a bit more to you. Uh, this was longer than I intended it to be, so sorry if I'm boring. Um, but I hope you can realize that this book isn't just a bunch of funny stories. Like, there is something deeper going on here, and especially about what it means to be an American, what it means, uh, to want approval from your family, what it means to be an American family, and also um, ideas of race and gender and sexuality in our culture. Um, I hope maybe it's inspired you to look at other David Sedaris books. Um, the audiobooks, if you drive a lot, uh, the audiobooks are so funny because he reads them uh, himself and he's he really, really funny. Um, so I hope you liked it. Uh, the discussion questions um, really ask you to kind of further consider the things uh, that I've kind of uh, explained in more detail uh, that I see going on in the text, and I'm really excited to see what you have to say. Um, your first paper assignment is also posted, um, in which you can either write about Family Guy or Let's Explore Diabetes with Owls. Um, so I really hope that you enjoyed it and you see its relevance um, to popular culture. All right, uh, next time I'm talking to you about The Office, so that'll be super fun. Bye!